Marty McFly is the picture of 1980s California cool no matter what era he's in. But there's still a lot you might not know about the young star of Back to the Future, so we're here to fill you in on the more obscure details of Marty McFly's past, present, and future. Michael J. Fox brought exactly the right amount of charm and mischief to the role of Marty McFly in Back to the Future, making the character created by writer Bob Gale and director Robert Zemeckis feel realistic, relatable, and even a little impish. Had filmmakers shot the original version of the movie script, however, a very different Marty would have ended up on screen. The first iteration of Back to the Future involved Marty working for Doc Brown, a disgraced physicist who makes a living bootlegging videos. In one early draft of the script, Marty explains that he sweeps out Doc Brown's garage in exchange for $50 a week, free beer, and access to his old record collection. Initially, the time machine wasn't a DeLorean, but a laser-based chamber resembling a car wash, according to executive producer Steven Spielberg. Nevertheless, Marty didn't know it enabled time travel and actually climbed into it with a much darker motivation. According to Bob Gale, he thought it was this thing that was going to shoot off this big electrical discharge. He was so despondent about how messed up his life was, he was going to commit suicide. We thought that was a good idea for way longer than we should have. Beloved Canadian actor Michael J. Fox is inextricably associated with the role of time-traveling teenager Marty McFly, a testament to Back to the Future co-writer and director Robert Zemeckis' good instincts. But while Fox was his first choice for the part, it turns out that Fox wasn't actually the first actor to portray Marty McFly. At the time of the film's shooting, Fox was starring in the NBC sitcom Family Ties, which left little time for anything else in his schedule. So filmmakers went with their second choice, Eric Stoltz, an up-and-coming young actor best known at the time for the drama Mask. A few weeks into filming, however, a sinking realization set in for the filmmakers. Stoltz was all wrong for the part. That, coupled with Fox's sudden availability, led to Stoltz's dismissal from Back to the Future and the film's production starting over. More than 30 years after its release, the most lingering question about Back to the Future remains. How did a teenage boy who only cares about cars, guitars, and girls become best friends with an old, disgraced scientist? It's never explained in any of the movies, but Bob Gale says that it's included in the backstory he and Robert Zemeckis wrote to inform their script. Speaking to Mental Floss, Gale explained, For years, Marty was told that Doc Brown was dangerous, a crackpot, a lunatic. So, being a red-blooded American teenage boy, aged 13 or 14, he decided to find out just why this guy was so dangerous. Marty sneaked into Doc Brown's laboratory and was fascinated by the cool stuff he found there. Doc caught him, and instead of being upset, he was delighted by Marty's interest in his work. After that, Doc hired Marty to be his assistant. Released in October 2015, Bob Gale helped co-write a five-issue Back to the Future comic miniseries. In the first issue, Gale provided yet another explanation for how the time-traveling scientist met the young guitarist. In the comic, the action flashes back to 1982. Minor film villain Needles plays with a band called the Tabascos, but his rock and roll good times are interrupted when some fanciful piece of technology called an interositor tube in his guitar amp blows out. Needles steals Marty's guitar and says he'll only return it if Marty brings him a new interositor tube. Marty dutifully hits a local music store in search for the part, but is informed that all of its interositors happen to have been purchased by local weirdo scientist Emmett Brown. That prompts Marty to head to Doc Brown's garage to steal what he needs. Doc has rigged the space with a unique security system of traps and puzzles, but Marty navigates them with ease. Doc Brown isn't angry with Marty for his attempted burglary, but instead so impressed that he offers him a job. Thus begins their most beautiful friendship, one that we all know will stand the test of time. At the outset of Back to the Future, Marty cares about little more than his girlfriend Jennifer Parker. Jennifer and Marty are married by the time of the events of Back to the Future Part 2, making them that most romantic, all-American cliché, high school sweethearts who found a lifetime of love in each other. According to the 2016 comic Back to the Future Untold Tales on Alternate Timelines, Marty and Jennifer first met in the fourth grade, but they weren't particularly close from the get-go. They reconnect when they're older in November 1984, but the meeting is ruined when Marty's rival Needles pulls up in his Ford F-150 and asks out Jennifer. Marty is so distracted by Needles' sweet ride that he doesn't pay much attention to Jennifer, who storms off. However, the next day, the seeds of their relationship were planted when Jennifer flirts with Marty when she finds him playing wild gunman at 7-Eleven and flirtatiously nicknames him Clint Eastwood. In order to meet publication deadlines, writers of film novelizations often base their stories on early screenplay drafts. As a result, the Back to the Future novelization differs wildly from the movie, offering up significant background detail on music-obsessed Marty McFly. The story begins with Marty in school, not paying attention to an educational film because he's jamming out to something on his Walkman. He's soon summoned to the office for what's purportedly an emergency phone call, but is actually Doc Brown asking him to come to a time machine test at Hill Valley Mall. 
When Principal Strickland confronts him about the call, Marty drops his contraband Walkman, earning him detention. The administrator then makes an example of Marty by destroying the cassette player in a woodworking vice. Marty ultimately gets the upper hand by setting off a fire alarm so he can sneak off to his band's audition for a YMCA dance across town. Marty's prank was actually filmed for the Back to the Future movie when Eric Stoltz was still set to star, but the scene ended up going unused in the finished film. At the end of Back to the Future, Marty uses his musical ability to inadvertently invent rock and roll by inspiring Chuck Berry via a phone call from the rock pioneer's cousin Marvin. You know that new sound you're looking for? Well, listen to this! And yet, when we catch up with Marty in 2015, at the start of Back to the Future Part 2, Marty is not the world-famous rock star he seemed fated to become. He's a broken, overworked office drone hampered by a chronic injury suffered in a long-ago car accident. That accident is averted by the end of Back to the Future Part 3, and in an episode of the Back to the Future animated series, we see Marty's musical dreams have finally come true. The 1991 episode Solar Sailors takes place in the year 2091, where Doc encounters a guy who professionally and musically impersonates one of the biggest rock stars of all time, Marty McFly. Fans of Back to the Future have long wondered why George and Lorraine McFly fail to recognize the fact that their son Marty looks exactly like Calvin Klein, the guy they met back in the 50s. Bob Gale offered a reasonable explanation to The Hollywood Reporter in 2020, saying, George and Lorraine only knew Marty slash Calvin for eight days when they were 17. I would ask anyone to think back on their own high school days and ask themselves how well they remember a kid who might have been at their school for even a semester. However, Gale and co-writer Robert Zemeckis did include a scene in the first three drafts of the Back to the Future script where George McFly sees a photo of Marty in 1955 and figures out his son is a time traveler. They cut this bit, choosing instead to make Biff the one who realizes Marty can travel through time. Doc Brown's DeLorean is already a pretty cool car, but the final moments of the first Back to the Future show that Doc has made some improvements to the vehicle. Roads? Where we're going, we don't need roads. In the fourth issue of the 2016 Back to the Future comic book series, it's made clear that Doc Brown turned his car into a marvelous flying machine upon the suggestion of Marty McFly. Set in a period before the events of the first film, Marty disturbs Doc in his garage, who covers up his work-in-progress DeLorean. Marty, without a car and desperately in want of one, recognizes the shape and presumes that Doc's top-secret project is a flying car. It's not, but Doc Brown thinks that such an ambitious project would actually be a pretty good idea. Back in the early 2000s, animator Justin Roiland made an obscene cartoon short called The Real Animated Adventures of Doc and Marty. The former is a wild-haired scientist with a DeLorean-esque time machine who speaks in an imitation of Christopher Lloyd, while the latter is a kid in an orange puffy vest with a high-pitched squeak of a voice. In other words, they're clear parodies of Doc Brown and Marty McFly, with little more than a misspelled name keeping them from incurring the wrath of the copyright holders. Royland screened this cartoon and others at Channel 101, a regular short film showcase and competition in Los Angeles operated by community creator Dan Harmon. Harmon asked Royland to adapt Doc and Marty into a regular, more professionally animated series that ditched the more overt Back to the Future connections. So Doc became a scientist named Rick, and it was a short leap from Marty to Morty, who became the scientist's grandson. Thus, Rick and Morty was born. In addition to portraying Marty McFly and other various McFly family members in the Back to the Future films, Michael J. Fox reprised his role as Marty in the LEGO Dimensions video game and in Back to the Future the game, playing a future version of Marty. But Michael J. Fox isn't the only actor to ever portray Marty McFly in a finished production. During the iconic Johnny B. Good sequence from the first film, Marty's singing was handled by Mark Campbell, a real-life rock frontman, while established voice actors took over the role for the film's various spin-offs. While Fox's voice does appear in Back to the Future the Game, the primary version of Marty McFly is portrayed by actor A.J. Locasio, who also lent his voice to a couple of Back to the Future-themed talking pinball games. And the Marty in the 1990s Back to the Future Saturday morning cartoon is actually a voice actor named David Kaufman, who can perform such a great impression of Fox that he also took over for the actor when his 1998 movie Stuart Little was adapted into an animated series. In Back to the Future, Marty McFly travels back in time to 1955, which just so happens to be the year a dramatic romance film called Marty was released, which went on to win the Academy Award for Best Picture. But screenwriters Bob Gale and Robert Zemeckis claim that this is all a coincidence and that Marty is actually named for a production assistant from the film Used Cars. Both filmmakers worked on that 1980 film, and they're referring to crew member Marty Casella, who curiously was not among the Back to the Future production staff himself. As for the last name of McFly, Zemeckis just tossed it out as a possibility, and it stuck. While that's a real last name, it also comes from a movie. 
1967 film The Honey Pot starred Cliff Robertson as a character named William McFly, which Back to the Future Part 3 later revealed is also the name of Marty McFly's great-grandfather. On the other hand, it could just be an amazing coincidence. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite movies and TV shows are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.